This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, best-selling author Daniel Silva on spies and art forgers. I'm a selfish writer in a certain sense that I like to deal with things that interest me. And so Gabriel allows me to indulge my passion. When I do write violence, I try to write it, this is going to sound strange, but I try to write it with certain grace and beauty. That's why you'll oftentimes see me reach for artistic imagery and imagery from paintings when I'm writing about violence. Um, I'm sort of (laughs) hiding the fact that I really don't like writing about it very much. Truly great art restorers make great forgers. And so the twist of the novel is that in order to catch the greatest art forger who ever lived, Gabriel must become the greatest art forger who ever lived. Daniel Silva, welcome to Chatter. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's a uh... I've been so looking forward to this. Me too. Me too. And and we are talking at a at another big moment for you. We are days away from the publication of your twenty fifth novel. Do I have the number right? Yes, you do. Twenty five. I, I I cannot believe that I've written twenty five books. Yeah, um, <laughs> you I, probably I, I, never I, intended to write that many. I'm guessing. I mean, I I never dared to imagine that I could actually. Um, pull it off and earn a living at, 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 as, a, as a novelist is what I wanted to do. But I, I thought I would, would um, you know, follow the model of my friend David Ignatius when uh-huh. I was in journalism and, um, um, and, and, you know, published novels on the side. And it just, yeah. I, I was fortunate enough to get a bestseller on my, on, uh, right out of the gate. Um, and they wanted the follow up right away. Is that right? Um, I try. I tried to do both for a while. Yeah, uh, for a few months. Um, I, w- I was writing, um, writing in the morning, writing late at na- night, <laughs> going to work, and it was just not going to work. It's two, two jobs, isn't it? I had two, and I had two young children. Oh wow, that's hard. Yeah. Um, and so I just. Um, my, my publishers were kind enough to tack on a couple of additional books on my contract. Yeah. It was enough to where I could say, okay, this is, the, uh, I'll make the leap. And so. Amazing. I, yeah. And this That's, is the 22nd Gabriel Alon novel. This right? 22nd Gabriel Alon novel. Also not, not supposed to happen. I mean, I, um, you know, Gabriel was built to be a one-off character. Is that he was, right? He was supposed to. Yeah, supposed to sail off into the sunset, quite literally, at the end of of, uh, of the first book. Uh, uh, kill, that was Kill Artist, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can't. I, you know, I I don't like that title, so I never really say it. Huh? Um, why not? It was a title, it was a title that was um, uh, foisted upon me, and I just never liked it. Um, I had a different title on that on that book, um, and and that ac- up being actually the title for the fifth book in the series, quite by coincidence. Uh, my my editor chose it. Um, but yeah, he was supposed to be one off character and I was, as luck would have it, I was acquired, um, by Putnam, Mm. um, had a legendary publisher there who said to me, this guy has what it takes to be a, a, you know, a long running series and a, a mass market character. Mm -hmm. And I, I, is I told her, Phyllis Grand, legendary figure in publishing, I thought she was mistaken. You know, I did not think that an Israeli uh, character would work as a mass mm. character. I thought there was too much anti-Israeli sentiment in the world, too much anti-Semitism in the world, frankly. I said, it's just not going to work. And she says, try it. Um, so I wrote, um, I took him out of the counterterrorism context and dropped him into an, an art story. Um mm-hmm. And that sold more than the previous book. Wow. And then I wrote a Vatican thriller that sold more than the previous book. And I boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And by about the, the fourth book in the series, I, real, I realized I had a, I had a series. <laughs> so like it that. took you four <laughs> novels to realize that maybe I like this guy. Yeah, I, I, I liked him. I liked him. Yeah. Definitely. Um, you know, he had, had two very distinct sides to his character. So he's a, was a joy to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that he was both an intelligence officer and had this artistic side to him. 
um, and he allowed me to, to write, two, you know, two very different kinds of, of, of books. Yeah. Um, he's a very flexible character. I can drop him into almost anything. Right. Um, and I, I, um, you know, in all honesty, I, I really wanted to write books rather like the new one earlier, um, in, in the, in, in the series. And, you know, my, my editor and publisher at the time really wanted Gabriel to be one of those tough guy characters, mm -hmm. um, um, a little bit more violent than I wanted him to be, but, um, it all worked. He became a number one, a perennial number one, uh, sure. uh, New York times bestselling character, much to my surprise. What was it? The publisher saw in him that made her think he had longevity as a, a franchise. Um, I mean, he was a very cool character. There's yeah. no doubt about that. He was a cool guy. He was conflicted. Um, he had tragedy in his 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 backstory, um, he, and then the, the fact that I I turned I turned an art restorer into a, <laughs> I mean, no one has ever I've never even really been an art restorer character before that I, right. I hit upon this notion and that that restoration was so key. Uh, to his character and to the, to the stories. I mean, every the, the first novel was structured. The plot was structured as though it were a restoration. Mm -hmm. Restoration is the theme of the, of the series. Um, you know, readers of the series know that Gabriel can fix just about anything. I mean, he can not only fix paintings, but he can make old cars run again. And um, you know, he's just got that that knack, um, and he's pretty darn good at fixing people as well. Yeah. Um, sure. But he, for the longest time, he could he could he could fix everything, everyone, but his but his first wife and himself. Okay. Um, and he has finally restored himself to to a, a large degree. He's in a good place in his life, um, and that's reflected in in the new book. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll we will talk about the new book. Um, I want to start though, just with you. Uh, uh, because you 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 alluded to the fact that you were a journalist and had mm -hmm. kind of made the leap, but uh, even before that, like, so where did you? Uh, where were you born? Where did you grow up? I I had a, a split childhood. Um, half my childhood in, in Western Michigan, in, um, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, and then my my parents decided in 1968 that they wanted to move to California. All right. Yeah, so we became Californians. We loaded up the car and and um, and settled in California. They're school teachers. Um, were they out there, sort of? It was uh, seeking the American <laughs> dream and fantasy, or they just wanted to yeah, the yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so we went from this midwestern life to this to, to California in 1968. Um, wow, where in California were you? I lived in the in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, just outside the Bay Area. Okay. So um, um, had San Francisco and every, all the craziness that was going on there on our doorstep, but we didn't we didn't live in San Francisco, we lived out in the valley. So we lived in a normal place um, and had the you know the wonderful um, stuff that was going on in, in 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 San Francisco in the late 1960s. Just had a big influence on me um, yeah. and. Um, I actually returned to San Francisco as a graduate student and lived there. And that's where I started my career. Um, it's in San Francisco. Did you grow up reading spy novels or have any sense I did. of the genre? I, did. I, 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 my mom was a huge, huge reader of, of commercial fiction. Um, and I actually started reading, I read at a high level um, as, as a kid, um, read uh, John Steinbeck, as it like many California kids, you know, mm -hmm. Steinbeck. Um, he's a huge influence on my work, um, especially the the uh, Cannery Row and Sweet mm -hmm. Thursday, that little uh, mini series of his. Um, he's a big, big influence on my work. Love Jack London as a kid. As a kid, um, my father got me inter interested in in uh, in spy stories. He's a history teacher, so I became interested in. In history, one thing led to another, and 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 here I am. But I, I, I really, um, my influences are a blend of literary fiction and commercial fiction, and mm -hmm. that's how I sort of ended up with that um, that sort of goulash that is a Daniel Sullivan novel. 
And it comes across in your work too, because it's it 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 it, it does it's not you know pure action thriller. Uh, it's also it, it it is it is kind of it is um it's meant to be characters that are relatable and that people can the story is very propulsive. So it, you can see that balance of of having strong literary influence, but also, you know, making something that can be you know, commercially viable. Which yeah. is I mean, I, I, I am a, I am a literary novelist masquerading as a thriller writer. That is, <laughs> it, it is the God's honest truth. Yeah. Um, I, I, I write violence um, because it's necessary for the, uh, for, for the genre. Um, but, but I don't like actually writing it. Um, I, my character has to carry a gun. Um, I learned how to, to shoot uh, uh, handguns and other uh, other weapons, you know, as part of my research for this character. But I really am not. I am not a gun person. Um, like you know, a lot of people in my genre really are gun people. You know, mm. I am not a gun person. Um, I uh, I don't I don't I don't care for gun culture. I was I grew up around it. Yeah, uh, there's a firearm in, in the house, but uh, it's just doesn't, not something that I'm really into. Um, but I, when I do write violence, I try to write it. This is going to sound strange, but I try to write it with certain grace and beauty. Mm-hmm. And I get too gross about it, and you know that's why you'll oftentimes see me reach for artistic imagery and imagery from paintings when I'm mm-hmm. writing about um, violence, um, because it, I'm sort of <laughs> hiding the fact that I really don't like writing about it very much. Yeah. Why did you decide that uh, you wanted to explore international intrigue and, you know, in violent subject matter as a novelist? What, well, I mean, I, I was a, uh, briefly a, a, a foreign correspondent. I worked in the Middle East. Um, it um, It is a violent place. Its history is filled with violence. Um, um it, I didn't, I, I explored the issues uh, more than the, than the vi- I didn't get into it because it's, it was violent. Uh, the violence is just something that came along with it. Um, and, you know, Gabriel has violence at the core of his backstory. He was one of the people who w- were sent to Europe after, after the Munich Olympic massacre to go kill the Palestinians. Um, some who were directly involved, some who were not so directly involved. Um, he, he personally killed uh, six people close range. Um, and, and, you know, that was not who he was. He was an art student for God's sake. <laughs> he was a lousy soldier, hated the army. Um, but he also happened to speak German with a Berlin accent because his, his parents were both German Jews. His mother was from Berlin. His grandfather was a famous German and expressionist painter. And he happened to speak with his mother's accent. And he was, was a perfect fit for that operation. Did you, did, how did you conceive of him? That is, he was, I, mean, I imagine he probably wasn't fully born in your no, head. No, I mean, he, I mean, he didn't, he didn't um, emerge fully fully formed. Um, it's just a, it's a process. Um, and the, the, the first key notion of, of, of how, how to think of it is, is when I was working on that book, he was really the second tier, the, the Palestinian, um, um, master terrorist was really the primary mm, character yeah. when I first drew it up. Um, and Gabriel was a, was a lesser character. Um, and then once I, settle on the fact that he was going to be an art restorer and he was just so interesting. He, I flipped the book and he actually became the, the, the primary guy. Uh, he just took over that project. Um, had, had everyone else out of the way and said, this right. is, this is my book um, and put it in my hands and, and um, I'll take care of it for you. Had you been interested in art restoration or, just fine painting in general. Where, where... I'm, I'm um, interested in art, love art. Uh, there, it, it, there was a character, a professional assassin, former KGB assassin uh, who appeared in the t- two previous books, who was a painter, um, watercolorist, but darn good. And I think in many respects, he's sort of the charcoal sketch for Gabriel Mann. His name is Jean-Paul Delaroche. That was his, his, mm-hmm. the name he lived under. Um, and then um, I... I sort of took him, 
put, put a few extra layers on him and, and, and he became Gabriel Lund. I, I really, when I really look back on it, and I think that he is the, um, it, 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 he's where Gabriel began. Yeah. I've read that you, as if from an early age, wanted to write. Um, did you get into journalism as a way of writing? So what was your experience of how you got into that profession and kind of what itch did it scratch for you? I, um, I was told by my junior uh, year uh, English teacher in high school that um, I was a good writer and that I could probably make a living as a writer, um, Mrs. Hunt. And I, I chose journalism as a sort of a way to get there. Um, you know, most of my literary heroes, whether they're Hemingway or, or Graham Greene, you know, they were journalists first. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, getting an MFA and sitting on my uh, butt for a few years, you know, scratching my head, thinking about my first novel, that was not an option for mm-hmm. me. You know, I had to go out and, and make my way in the world and earn a living. So it just seemed a natural uh, uh, fit for me. So I, I, I studied, uh, had double major journalism and political science. Both disciplines allowed me uh, to take um, gobs and gobs of English, uh, which contributed. To, yeah, so I, I, I almost have, I almost have a double major with a, with a minor in English uh, literature. And, um, you know, just, so I studied journalism politics, um, international relations in graduate school in English and turned myself into um, uh, the person I wanted to be. And then I got a job uh, straight out of uh, grad school. I did not finish my, my degrees. One thing I'm really still bothers me to this day that I didn't finish my master's degree, oh, but really? I, got a, I got the job I wanted. Um, <laughs> you can always go back and do it, but you might have to take time off from writing novels. I know. <laughs> I think they, they, they want to give me an honorary degree, but it just doesn't seem, doesn't seem right. I want to finish. I actually want to go back and finish it. Um, and I, I just got, I got a job at United Press International in San Francisco. Oh, great. Um, That's a great first I, gig for a role. It was a great first gig. I, um, Covered the Democratic Convention in 1984. Um, that you know, it was just I, I was thrilled at, at the way that it, the, the start I had, and then I was transferred here to Washington to work on the foreign desk, and then transferred overseas. Where and were you overseas? And I was based in Cairo, and then I um, also um, um, had a. Uh, residence visa and lived part-time in the Persian Gulf in Bahrain. Yeah. Sort of shuttle back and forth. So that must, it was, that must have been something of a culture shock to go from wire service in San Francisco, boom, you're in Washington, and suddenly you're a foreign correspondent. <laughs> and that, that is what I wanted to do. That yeah. is what I wanted to do. Um, I, I studied Spanish, <laughs> thinking that I was I wanted to work in Latin America. Um, it would and, have been a good place to be. And then, up and then I was slated to go to Johannesburg. Then I got rerouted to go to, to Nairobi, and then um, um, finally ended up in, in, with an opening in Cairo. So, so the, the not the place I in, in expected I was going to work, yeah. but boy, am I glad I, I ended up there because. I, I just, um, um, I really fell in lo- love with, with, with Egypt. Um, had some, had some fun with the local security service when I was there. Um, and it just gave me a, a, a um, a taste of intrigue. Yeah. Uh, um, this mysterious city, this mysterious culture. And it was just, a, it, it was really when I, w- I was there that I really, really, um, started thinking about about uh, um, the the next the next step. The next step, yeah. And did you think about being able to use your access as a reporter to to learn things, to kind of get inside different worlds and and start playing around with how you might represent them in fiction? Um, uh, yeah, a little, um, but um, always with 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 fiction first and then the facts to support it second. Um, right. um, 
you know, I, I, I yes, journalism is, is it, it, it does teach you how to gather information, uh, where to go for information, who to speak to, it gives you entree. Um, it teaches you, I mean, especially wire service writing, how to write on a deadline. Absolutely. Um, you know, I could, as a young kid, um, get on a phone, a pay phone back in the, back in those days, and, and to go through with a reporter's pad and dictate finished copy over the phone. Um, and it helps. I mean, I prefer to write very, very slowly, when, um, but when I'm under the gun and I need to, to, to get a book finished, I can put the, put the hammer down. So you right. were in Cairo when you first started, probably more than, you probably a toy with the idea of being a novelist already writing a novel, right. but is that where the seed kind of starts to germinate in Cairo? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I um, actually um, wrote some little fictional vignettes when I was there and, and uh, did some, did some fiction writing, very private. No one has ever seen it. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, in my, in my copious amounts of spare time, and I, I'm, I'm being facetious, <laughs> we'd start scratching away at a little bit of fiction when I was there. Yeah. When did you decide, all right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write this novel? <laughs> I told my wife, who knew none of this, what I really, really wanted, wanted to do. And when she stopped laughing, um, <laughs> she said, okay, well, go for it. So I would... Um, um, at that time, I was the executive producer of, of CNN's political talk show unit. So you're back in Washington now. Yeah. Married, kids on the way. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I would, I would just get up early in the morning, write for a couple of hours, and then just set it aside, right. um, get ready for my first conference call of the day. Um, right. And after, I don't know, eight, nine, ten months, somewhere in there, I had a, I had a, a, a first draft of, of a novel done. I didn't tell anyone that I was mm -hmm. doing this at work. <laughs> and, and I started, I started showing it around and, um, I got very lucky. I got, I got picked off a slush pile as we call it in the, in, in the trade. Wow. Um, yeah. The slush pile. Did you have an agent? unsolicited manuscript? It was unsolicited. Unsolicited manuscript, and it, what they do is they give it. It, um, it was at Moro where it's, the process started. You know, Friday night, the the low level assistants get a, a case of beer and they sit in there and go through this, this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and someone started reading my book and like liked it. <clears throat> it was a big World War II thriller, um, and. Um, I was I was brought in for a meeting and told that we don't publish this kind of stuff right now, but um, this is good and this is what you should do. And one thing led to another, and, and I I, um, I ended up selling that that first uh, that first manuscript. Wow. Yeah. Why didn't you tell people about it? Um, it's <laughs> you know what I still don't tell people what I'm working on or. Um, but you didn't even tell them you were toying with a potential second. Career. No, no, I did not. No, it came as quite a surprise. <laughs> it came as quite a surprise. Guys, I'm going to need to take a leave of absence because I oh just, my gosh. This book. yeah, um, it was, came as quite a surprise to my employers. Yeah. Were you afraid that if they knew that, that they would think that your commitment to producing the talk shows was? Uh, no, was no. I wanted to preserve the right to fail in private. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So I think some writers need just that moral support, just talking about what they're working on. Right. Um, I talk about it with my wife. Sure. I, I, I talk to her constantly when I'm, when I'm, uh, she pretends to listen. Um, she's got a job of her own. She's pretty uh, busy these days too. She's, what, she is, your wife uh, is Jamie Gangle, who is covering the hell out of the January 6th commissions among other things. It is um, really, it has been it has been such a treat and an honor to watch her cover this story. Yeah, she's um, done a great job. She has done an incredible job. Um, it's not by accident. I mean, she's on, I mean, the phone rings at six 30 in the morning and she's on the phone, um, until, until 11 or midnight, most nights. Um, yeah. As we yeah. say in the trade, she's hustling. <laughs> she's working it, man. She's nonstop. Yeah. So she's, um, 
it's been a, it's been a real privilege to watch her report this. But story. she still finds time to read the manuscripts and tell you what she thinks. She does. Uh, she took a. Um, we were able to. We hit this little dead spot um, as the committee was getting ready uh, to to um, get the hearings up and running to to read out the final draft with me, and um, it was, it, you know. She would have to keep the phone right here, so we we, we read it aloud. Okay, um, to each other, um, and so so the this novel was edited while while she was reporting the other the other stories. Wow, last year's book was written, um, <laughs> you know, while the while the Capitol was under siege. So right, same thing. Right to to go back to your first book. So you're 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 waking up in the morning. You're writing, and then you kind of kind of put that down, and yeah. then you've got to go do this job of you know negotiating and producing you know high wattage television. It's something new, kind of every day. Did you find it difficult to toggle between that kind of slow, more deliberative process to having to go into producing TV, which is so you know it's explosive and it changes by the by the hour. Uh, it has to be something new and fresh all the time. I found it to be that they just complimented it. Mm. Uh, um, it. It gave me an outlet. You know, I be, had reached the point to where I wasn't um, doing any writing anymore, and it, um, unless it was, you know, get a, you know, sit, move out of the way, let me do it, kind of mm-hmm, writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I needed to be, I needed to write. Um, but I just find it's just paired so beautifully, just this quiet, you know, time to myself in my fiction and my story. Um, and then at 8 a.m., I had to, you know, grab the stack of papers off the front porch um, and, and read until like a maniac until nine for my first conference call of the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pat Buchanan and Michael Kinsley. <laughs> That's who was on Crossfire then. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Or whoever it might be, you know, and John Sununu was was in that rotation, and I just had this incredible cast of characters that I worked with. You know, yeah, um, with, you know Jesse Jackson and and all the it's, Robert Novak. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just all day, every day. So it was it was a very demanding environment. It was an environment that was just full of political debate. Um, um, uh, thrashing out ideas with a really talented group of young producers. It was very stimulating. But then I had this quiet place to go to every morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, 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 it actually, as I said, it complimented, uh, it complimented each other. So where is the point where you have to make the decision? Do I want to be a journalist or do I want to be a novelist or do I want to try and do both? I try, I, 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 I published the first novel. I think it was, <clears throat> spent five or six weeks on the New York Times list. Very fortunate. Um, but I was just still not ready to commit to that, you know, that full time. I, I, I had two young kids. Um, it is a very difficult business publishing. Um, a lot of people have a couple of, of books and then can't sustain it. And I've, I've had eyes wide open about mm-hmm. it. Um, and as I said, I, I, I tried to write my second novel doing both and it just, I wasn't going to make my deadline. I was going to, um, you know, not, not hit that sweet spot of a year to 18 months after my first novel. And my publisher at the time was just said, okay, I'll put two additional books on, on the end of your contract and we'll do it that way. And. So he just basically, in effect, kind of bought me out of my mm. career. Which mm. was, and that's, that, that's the way it was just a, a cold business decision where, okay, I'll t- accept these contracts. It, they would pay me, you know, enough money, you know, to, you know, what I would earn through my, my uh, journalism career to, you know, the age of whatever. Right. Uh, and it was a, it was a, it was worth the gamble. Yeah. To, to, to do it, you know, full time um, and, and to not look back. And that's, that's the way I, I, I looked at it very, very coldly and care, carefully, but I had to, you know, I had, I had a wife and kids to support. 
And so did your day then go from as you're doing it full time, you're still writing in the morning, but you just keep writing all day long? Yeah, that's enough. Silence. Yeah. Alone. Yeah. Now, I, I, I was a long distance runner as a kid. I'm used to being alone for mm. long periods of time, loneliness of the long distance runner and all that. Um, and, and, um, but I wasn't really alone because I had two kids in the house. Yeah. Two little kids. Um, and that, that was the real blessing of it was that it was that I got to raise the children. Oh. Um, yeah, I was so there. Jamie, was Jamie stayed in journalism and worked in. Yeah, of course. Yeah. She was at NBC. Um, and I had, uh, I had uh, for 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 a while. I mean, I had we had a I had a, a nanny, but once they started in school, um, I you know took them to school in the morning, picked them up from school in the afternoon. Um, our house here in in Washington is literally right next door to Georgetown University, so we had a really group of great young uh, women from Georgetown who helped me out in the afternoon. Uh, so I could, you know, just look after them, give them a little dinner so I could keep working right. until Jamie came home. And, but that, that, that was the, the best part of that decision was that I got to be with my, my kids all day, yeah. every day. Yeah. So what is a typical day like for you now? I mean, you're, and you're cranking out these novels. I mean, it seems about like once, one every year or 18 months. I mean, you're really on a cycle. Yeah, so- I'm a, I'm a, I'm a once a year. Wow. I'm on the same day every year, um, usually the second Tuesday of July. I think right. we I have to count them this year. Um, July 4th kind of interfered with it this year. So I'm, and we should I'm, say people like wait all year for these books. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know people who are such devoted fans. They devour it and they can't wait for you to write the next one. And you are there toiling away every day making it. So what's your typical day? I read the papers first and, you know, grab a, go downstairs and grab some coffee. And, and, um, um, I read the post, the times, the journal, uh, times of, of, uh, London and the Atlantic and that, you know, the daily New Yorker, which is filled. I mean, there's so much to read. I could just a journalist. In I know. I know. It's just, it, um, and then, so usually by about, um, nine o'clock I'm, I'm dressed and, and sitting banging away and you know, September, October, I try not to overdo it, mm-hmm. you know, mid afternoon I'll stop. And then, you know, November, I'm starting to get a little anxious. I'll work a little longer. December, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting fidgety by January 1st. That's, that's when the doors get locked, the phones get switched off, and I, I'm really I can I I don't know how long you can sit and 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 write when you need to, but I can I can do ten or twelve hours yeah. if I, I need if to. You have to. If I have to, it's not the it's not perfect, um, but I can do it. And do you and is, so does that kind of the hunker down part come in January because the deadline January. is approaching? Yeah, my 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 um, hand in deadline is. Um, April 1st. Wow. And then we do, um, I get us, I get to hand in a second typescript on April 15th and it goes into copy editing, but I, I'm going to, I rewrite through copy editing in the galleys. Wow. Um, I've made my last changes probably around the 26th of May. And they say, they, they say two, two o'clock, this goes to the printer. Yeah. So we, um, I have my, um, my editor and a person from the production department, um, and actually caught some things in my final pass through on that day. And we email them, they do final, final changes. And it's, it's very tight. I mean, don't you think that, don't you get a fresh look at material when it's in galleys or out of your typescript? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, and, I, and, and it's, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that for people who don't maybe know the ins and outs of book publishing, these are all the sort of back and forths that a writer goes through with the editor and you kind of make everything just so before you send it off. Um, publishing is a, is a notoriously slow business. 
uh, for, for, a, for a lot of people. I mean, you know, nonfiction books, maybe it can be three years before it comes out. You're describing something, though, that's happening at a pretty breakneck speed breakneck. You know, publishing a book. I mean, that, this is almost like getting a magazine article out. There. It's almost oh, almost like that. Um, yeah. and, and so it, it's just part of my schedule. Like I, I don't I'm not one of those people that you know, have a finished book already done when the new new one is. And, you know, Lee Child, when he was still writing his the series, you know, full time, he was just like me where he would publish and then start a book. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of us like that who are who are repeaters, as we as we're known in the mm. trade, you know, annual best selling authors who are right up against it, right up yeah. against it. Yeah. Um, so I've never been able to get ahead. And, and um, so it's a very, very tight, tight finish at the end. Has there ever been a point where you thought, I'd like to just slow this down and maybe I'll do a book every three years or. Uh, you, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting to that point in, 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 a, in my dotage. Um, I, would, <laughs> I, will, I will definitely slow down. I will yeah. definitely slow down. And, you, and I mentioned you're doing it now for the joy of it too, right? I mean, obviously, you know, when your book comes out, it's going to do great. You know, your fans want it, but you have to love sitting down and writing these stories for 10 hours a day. You, and you can't to. do it you otherwise. You have to. I, as I like to say, um, you, you have to have the, the, the personality where you can't not write. Okay. Right. That's right. I mean, if you don't have that, um, you know, it's probably, you should probably think about doing something else in yes. life. You know, Philip Roth, for example, you know, he, when he finally decided to retire, I mean, he couldn't read fiction. He had to be very careful about reading the newspaper because, because your brain starts going, mm -hmm. you know, he would sit and play with his phone and do other things to try to, to turn it off. Um, so that's, that. unfortunately, for better or worse, that's the brain I have. So I'm yeah. sitting reading the, the newspaper. I read something, um, you know, I, I, I see a story starting to develop. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I walk around with a, a short list of things that I want to get to. Um, the, the one will rise to the top at, 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 in the late stages of, of writing and, and editing the, the book. And I'll, I'll, I'll settle mm -hmm. on the next book. You know, in hearing you describe too, when you when you when you were first starting out and you would write in the morning and it's that period of refuge, you know, from that that takes you away. And I imagine it probably, you know, still even feels like that. But it's I, I have found book writing to be the most deeply satisfying kind of writing, precisely because you immerse entirely in this process and everything else just kind of shuts out. And it's, I mean, even in the pandemic, when I was working on long projects, it was a way of turning away from a world that felt very out of control and very scary. And then you're turning into a world in which you are kind of in control or at least pretending to be. Um, but do you have the ability, you and your colleagues, Carol Lenny, to just drop a bomb out there and really... Yeah move the needle. That's um, true. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't have that. Uh, I, I can't do that with, I can tell a good story. I can entertain people, but isn't that, don't you, don't you also like that though? Breaking yeah. a story. It's the, it's the, it is the, it is the, 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 the best thrill of journalism, right? It's the hunt. Right it's the knowing you're onto something that no one else knows and you're about to tell them, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it's the moment of revelation. Right. And I think that's what keeps us absolutely keeps us going. And it's so, I mean, you mentioned them being kind of like complementary the journalism and 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 the and the, and the book writing. And I feel that way too. They're, they're they're exercising different muscles. They're satisfying different needs and kind of urges. But it, it is ultimately, I think, it's that it is still that basic urge to tell people something new, to tell them a story, to sit them down and say, "Look at this." It's just in reporting, it happens to be maybe about something that maybe is defect affecting their life directly or current events and you know you get the thrill of the bomb but with a novel you know these are people who are sitting down i mean you you probably have readers who sit these sit down and read these books from start to finish and don't get out of a chair so you you rivet don't, people <laughs> do. have you ever thought about writing fiction absolutely i'm playing around with it right now as a matter of uh, fact oh uh oh a new player on the scene uh, we'll see we'll see i have a long way i have a long way to go i i, I mean the 
the book on the, on the NSA, the way you handled Poindexter, you wrote him as though he were a character, is very beautifully done. Well, you, thank you. I, I know that you would do it incredibly well. Well, it's and it's and it's a way that I like. I like to read nonfiction narrative. It's you know nonfiction that reads like a novel, and you know it, it's it's actually maybe a good question for you too. I mean, when you sit down to write a book, do you see the structure and the plot? Like, do you know how it ends? I mean, when I wrote The Watchers, I basically knew like, okay, this is the the five act step we're going to go through and I can see it. But that was because I'd been reporting on it for a long time and kind of knew where I wanted to end up with the story. Do you sit down and know how it's going to go? I I like to have about 100 pages that I could outline. Mm. I don't you know, mentally out, put it on paper. I mean, I just mentally outline it. So as long as I have that to start i i get started on some did you were you able to finish the the, the new book uh new book? the one i'm working on now no i'm still working on it okay because there's it's a it has a it's a twist novel um big twists and, and um so a plot like that um i have to obviously see where i want to go but oftentimes if it's not that kind of of, of book um i will sort of surprised myself along the way. Okay. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not Raymond Chandler just starting with a sentence, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not terribly far removed from that. I don't, I don't know. And, and um, for the simple reason that I've never been able to outline something um, and then have it turn out that way. I tried it at one time. It just, the book turned out mm. completely differently. And I, I have to, I say to my wife, you know, I write these things sentence by sentence, by sentence, by sentence. Um, and no scene turns out exactly the way I, I had in mm-hmm. mind. I, and I, I, I know that a chapter, I, I, I'm trying to accomplish something. I know what I need to do. I, I don't start a chapter unless I have a, a, a you know, a clear um, image of how I want it to turn out. Um, and it almost never does, the, yeah. not the way I, I started. Um, within the book, I just, I just surprise myself every, every step of the way. Um, and so... Oftentimes, I will surprise myself to the point where what came before, oh, oh, this doesn't quite work anymore. So I will just go back and, and adjust. Um, I'm a, a, not comparing myself to Caravaggio, obviously, but I'm a bit like him. Mm. That, that um, he, you know, he painted without a preparatory sketch. He painted from live models. Right. He made mistakes. And he would 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 cover them up and, and repaint them. And right. if you could if you could see a Caravaggio painting, you could see those different things that he's done underneath mm-hmm. them. If you if you, you X rayed it, if you could X ray one of my manuscripts, something like that would you yeah. test, you'd see. Yeah, well, I, I go forward. Oh, this is a good idea. I'll go back, adjust. Do, 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 do. And you write by hand, right? I do write by hand. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So you can't just like, I mean, cut and paste, all right, and no, I I delete write, all that. Yeah. I write, I write in on legal pad. Um, I got a big comfy chair right there. Okay. And, um, and um, I, um, I will write and then I come over here and, and, and sit and, and, and type it in. And okay, usually I'll, I'll get to a, a point where I'll stay here. But I mean, most important passages of, of the of the books are written in, in longhand first is that just because uh, it slows you down you're thinking it slows you down i am um, um even as a journalist i'd like to sort of write things out a little bit in, in longhand mm-hmm. um i like the quiet of it um my, my legal pads don't they don't crash or eat all my copy right um, right. um it's just it's for me it's just it's, it's, it's interesting how I can, um, I mean, I'm sure you're guilty of it. Maybe you're not, but you sit here and you fiddle at the keyboard. Yes. Fiddle, fiddle. I, I just can sit with a, a legal pad and it's shocking the degree to which I can write perfect paragraph structured with a sentence, the right rhythm and flow, just by slowing it down. Wow. Yeah. Just by slowing it down. Um, and Tyler, one of my literary 
heroes, she takes, she writes her books out in longhand after she's finished them as part of an editing process to oh, expose, wow. to expose, to help expose flaws. Oh, that's uh, fascinating. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's a very, very useful tool. Yeah. Well, before we started talking, you mentioned that for the new novel, um, Portrait of an Unknown Woman, you, you kind of envisioned this as a reboot. Yeah. So talk about that a little bit. Um, well, Gabriel is, um, it, as prophesized at the um, end of the last book, he is, he is retiring. He has finished his five-year term as um, Director General of the Israeli Secret Intelligence Service. Um, his wife... Um, very astutely told him, we are not staying in Israel because they'll just drag you back in. Exactly. They need you. We're going to go and we're going to live in Venice. And there are I'm, worse places. Yeah, I'm going to run the, um, the most prominent restoration company in Venice and you're going to work for me. And so they have settled in Venice. Um, um, and he is in, in this novel, he is, he is, um, joins forces with the French and Italian police to track down, um, the world's greatest art forger. Um, and it's, it's just sort of a book I've just been dying to write for a long time. Mm. It's just sort of gets Gabriel where I always wanted him to be. Um, and so, yeah, this is the series, the series reset. Um, this is, this is where and how the story will end one day that, uh, Gabriel and his, his wife and children, um, living in Venice and, and getting into trouble every now and again. Yeah. It's a pretty good life. And, yeah. and, and I read that you were inspired by a real forgery scandal in France about 10 years ago, right? And, and, well, it started 10 years ago. The, the, uh, repercussions can continue. Um, the, um, the scandal in question was interesting um, because of the, the type of painting involved. Mm. Um, most forgery scandals involve 20th century works um, for the simple reason that they're much easier to forge. Um, and they, depending on the artist, they can be worth a whole hell of a lot of money. Um, what was interesting about this forgery scandal was that the... Um, the paintings were old masters, mm. old masters. Mm. This man, I, I'm not going to say his name because not, no one has been prosecuted yet, but we, we believe we've identified him, could stand at a at an easel and paint like Franz Hals on one day, Orazio Genelesi on another day, Lucas Cronach the Elder, and he could paint them so well that he could fool the very, very best eyes in the business. Um, he, with his portrait of a man by Franz Hals, he fooled the experts at the Louvre. Mm. He fooled the very best uh, Franz Hals experts in the, in the Netherlands. He is that good. Um, and of course, it's not just what's going on on the surface that matters. It's what's underneath because mm -hmm. we can look underneath with x-rays and all kinds of technology. He knew how to structure the paintings so that they looked like 500 year old paintings. A and um, I, I was just fascinated by that. And, and it was a perfect match for Gabriel because that is his, I mean, yes, he can, he can, clean a Cezanne in a pinch, but he's a, he, he cleans old masters. Yeah. Um, and of course, and he, he's truly one of the best art restorers of the world and, and truly great art restorers make great forgers. <laughs> 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 and so we have, we have seen Gabriel forge paintings before in this series. Um, he, he painted a version of, of, of Van Gogh's sunflowers uh, for uh, operational reasons once, but we're going to see him with a brush in his hand in this, in this book. Um, and so the twist of the novel is that in, in, in order to catch the greatest art forger who ever lived, Gabriel must become the greatest art forger who ever lived. Right. Uh, and there's a chapter in the book where we see him forging, um, uh, four paintings in in a hurry, and mm -hmm. it's one of the, one of my favorite things I've ever written because um, he really can do it. And I love I love stories about 
forgery and they make in, in addition to just being sort of great detective stories they become such an insight as you put it into the skill that the forger has to understand how a painting is composed chemically what it's made of the way an old master would have proceeded step by step what their process would have been and it's not just being able to draw something that looks like a no. painting it's being able to build it from nothing from nothing um i mean old old master uh i didn't i didn't duplicate it exactly but you know oil paints take a while to dry they would yes. put in a layer they didn't paint wet and wet like van gogh did so he'd Put it, put down a layer. I would sit there for a few days and dry. And then mm-hmm. they would do the next, and then do the next, and layer it, and layer it, and layer it. Um, um, and so I I show Gabriel doing that with the Titian, for example, like getting getting the gesso exactly right, um, knowing that that Titian did his under drawings not with any kind of piece of charcoal or something, I mean, um, but with a with a brush. With a, with a, he would make a mixture with a, with a, a black paint, with, and he would do his sketches actually with a brush. Uh, he did it all like that, uh, and showing how how it might be done. I skipped a few steps. Yeah, um, how to do it. Um, you know, the the one of the hardest parts about about um, forgery, especially with old masters, but any any type of painting, is the crackleur pattern. The mm-hmm. surface, the pattern of surface cracks. It is almost impossible to get it right. You know, all um, Italian crack allure is different from French crack allure, is different from Flemish crack allure, is different from Dutch. Each, because of the way that the, the, the painters were trained, the way they mix their paints, climate, they all have a different pattern. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is impossible, nearly impossible for forgers to get that right. In fact, when I looked at the, um, when I, looked at the, the paintings that that got past the Louvre, uh, for example, and looked at the detail images. Even, I'm an amateur, uh, but um, it, the crackler pattern was wrong on, on mm. all of them. And, and, and I, I, that became actually uh, the, a, a key key element in the plot. Um, the, 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 it, the crackler was just completely wrong. When you, when you read your books, I mean, it's your, it, the reader gets immersed in the world of restoration and just art and art history. So what are your, what over the years have been your resources for how you learned about that, to be able to write about it with a level of confidence? I wish I could take you on a tour of this, <laughs> of this place. Um, you know, I, 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 I went to my, my own personal private graduate school of art history and I put mm. myself to an art history course. And I, and I also have, people that I can rely on to, to help me to just look over my shoulder and read things to make sure I, I get it right. Yeah. I will say with a certain amount of pride and, and you've read a portion of this. I didn't make a single mistake in this novel Good. with anything art related. Yeah. And it's filled with art history and technical things. Um, um, aspects of the business. I, I, I got everything right on the first pass. Do you have time in your writing to go and enjoy museums? I mean, we live in Washington and we have some of the best museums in the world. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I love, I love art museums. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> we, we spent many summers in Italy. My children uh, joke about how they've been dragged from museum to museum, church to church. <laughs> how they've seen every Caravaggio in existence. Um, it, it's a, um, it's a passion of mine. And, yeah. and that's it. You know, Gabriel, he stands at the, at the intersection of a lot of things that I'm interested in. Um, the Middle East, obviously, uh, the history of the second world war of Nazi Germany, of the Holocaust, um, art. He just, he's, um, I'm a selfish writer in a certain sense that I like, I can, I like to deal with things that interest me. Oh yeah, um, and so Gabriel allows me to indulge my passions. Yeah. Do you and, and do you find that living in Washington? I mean, you, you could probably you probably could live anywhere. Of course, you know your wife is here and she's you know working and her career is here too. But do you still like being in D.C. Uh, even though yeah. you could probably go? I'm a, I'm a uh, I am a Florida resident, um, so we we uh, have a place there. Um, it's under renovation right now. So I've mm-hmm. been spending, um, a little more time here. 
Um, and now, I mean, I, I moved to Washington when I was 24. Um, Jamie went to, to, uh, to Georgetown. Um, she has lived in the, within a block of the, of the campus her entire life. That's we love Washington. Um, we, our children loved being raised here. Mm-hmm. It's a great city. It's one of the things that, that, um, angered me most about January 6th. Yeah. It really did. Um, I, I still will, you know, friends come to town. I'll still run them uh, to the Lincoln Memorial at midnight. Yeah. To walk up those steps into the, um, into that sanctuary. Yeah. Still, I love to, to drive by the Capitol at night. I love being inside the Capitol. I was so angry. Um, to see them smash windows and do the unspeakable things that they did inside the in, inside um, the the temple of our democracy, um, and and part of that is first of all as an American, but it's also my hometown. Our, our hometown. Yeah. Place where this is these are um, used to work there, yeah. um, and it just uh, I I I I love this town. Um, it, it's changed a lot since the since the mid nineteen eighties. Yeah, um, and you've and you've lived in Georgetown that pretty much the whole time you've been in DC. I lived um, actually. I've lived everywhere. When I um, when um, I first came, uh, have come come from San Francisco. Um, I lived in the Noe Castro district there, yeah, in, sure. in there and, the, and the neighborhood to, that felt the, to me that was uh, most like San Francisco. Was Dupont Circle, and Absolutely. I just I settled there. Um, yeah. It's just um, more urban, um, hipper, um, and, and I lived there. I lived on Capitol Hill. That's great. That's great. And I, I'm I'm with you too about feeling like you know when you when you go and you see the monuments and you go to museums. I mean, I joke that like the mall is like my backyard. Uh, you know, because I go and I ride my bike and you, and you can't help. At least I still get a chill every time I go down and, and see it. And it's uh, we're we're spoiled for it. I, I just I, I, I love this place. So no plans to relocate to Venice for you? No, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Venice is um, I love Venice. I love it. And I, I prefer to go in the wintertime. It's just mm. more comfortable. Well, it's not crowded. I love the cold weather in Venice, um, and I, I I had planned to go twice to do some extended periods of writing over there. And just every time I get ready to go, the the, the pandemic flare. Oh yeah. Um, I really wanted to go there during the the, the real lockdown. Uh, I don't know if you saw the photographs where the where the canals ran perfectly pristine clear for a few months because there was there was just there was less uh, garbage in the in the water less boat traffic and the the, the can- canals just went clear back amazing. like back in the day. yeah that's amazing i, I wish I, I could have seen that yeah well you're going to be on tour for this book which is yeah. great because you've been under lockdown for the past couple of years <laughs> i mean i am going to try where um jamie's going to go with me oh, that's I'm great double mask um and just if I can get through the, the, the planes without contracting the virus and then uh, the events are going to be um, as safe as we can make them. Mm-hmm. And hopefully this 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 surge won't hit us again. It's, yeah. it's, the, the country's there's some hot spots around. That's yeah. for sure. It must be very um, gratifying for you, though, to be to be able to be in the company of your readers again. It, it, it will, but unfortunately, we have to pre-sign the books and hand them out. We can't okay. do a signing line and okay. interact with anybody. So it's it's not quite the way it's um, it was in the past. And I'm not sure when it's going to be the. If you, if, if, I don't know how deeply you've dug in, dug into this this matter, but I'm not I'm I'm not sure we're going to get back for quite a while. Yeah, well, we'll we'll hope I that. hope I hope to get through it without the virus, and I hope that yeah. no one gets gets sick at any events. Um, well, we're just about at the end of our time. There's so many 
more things I want to ask you about. Uh, I will ask you to quickly uh, allude to something that's in the news now, because you play around with the themes of spyware and spy technology, spyware technology in mm-hmm. the new book. Do you want to say a couple of words about that? Um, well, I, I um, we were talking uh, bef- before we started uh, rolling the recording about um, because the the Israeli software Pegasus is is back in the news, and um, I show Gabriel using a fictitious version of Pegasus that he calls I call Proteus, and and I I've, I've dealt with this technology, uh, you know, for a for a long time in in the books because um, these Israelis are damn good at it, um, hacking hacking cell phones and and turning them against their 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 users. Um, and I, uh, as, as effective a tool it can be in, in the hands of a, of a responsible government organization. Um, I'm just very disappointed that, that the NSL group let this stuff loose, uh, on the international market and that it got in the hands of, of, of governments that should not have it. Um, and that it was used against journalists and against dissidents um, and, 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 and against anyone who, who dared to um, speak out or, or write against um, what, whatever regime was using it. Um, and, you know, my character has to use these kinds of things. People in my, in my line of work writing, writing thrillers, we have to deal with this kinds of technologies. I'm going to make a big confession here. I'm, I'm completely against it. Yeah. I am not, I am not, uh, I am not a fan of, of the surveillance state and that is putting it mildly. Um, I, I, I have a sense from, from reading your work that you have huge concerns about, yes. about, um, about uh, where we're where we're going, both in, both in commercially and with government, yeah. um, China is is um, is on the doorstep. I mean, they're already there, but they're they're full full Orwell in, yeah. in terms of that government's ability to to know, in, in fact, what one billion people are thinking and doing it every every minute of every day. Um, and the, the the future scares me uh, um, to have this technology in the in the hands of the wrong people and in our own government. Um, so I'm relying on you, Shane Harris, <laughs> uh, to make sure that it never happens. Um, and I, I hope that um, my my it is my fervent hope that um, that NSO Group. Um, I you know I I know that Israeli intelligence needs this type of this tool. Um, to, to monitor and, and any intelligence service does in, in, in today's world, but it should not be, it should not be in the hands of individuals and governments should not be out in the, in the, in the market. Um, and I hope that, that our blacklisting and the lawsuits that have been filed, <clears throat> I hope we, we run this company out of business uh, soon. Well, it's a, it's a very timely subject for you to tackle in your novel too, which is, is going to be really. Yeah, uh, Gabriel. Gabriel uses it. Gabriel uses it, but he um, has very he has deep, deep misgivings yeah. about, about how it has leaked out into the world. Yeah, and he yeah. he was it. He was a totally against giving it to to the Emiratis and the Saudis for sure. I suspect he is probably not dissimilar from a lot of real life analogs to him who realize this is a quite a, a double edged sword proverbially and this is what this is yeah 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 uh well as we close out here it is our tradition on chatter for the last question to be a randomly selected question from this is the chatter box that i am holding here so i'm going to reach in here to us it is opening what is coming out so we're going to see what the question is here for the last question this is like our version of the proust questionnaire this is this is this is almost too easy for a novelist but this will be a good one too um what books uh, or book is on your nightstand or your Kindle. Uh, so what's what are you reading right now, Daniel? <laughs> I just did. I just did uh, last week. I was on the Today Show. I had did I did summer reading picks. Oh, nice. Um, and and I I think I actually um, um, I might have made a couple of bestsellers. Um, so I, I'm gonna I want to read Geraldine Brooks Brooks's 
uh, book horse okay. as soon as I get um, finished with book tour. Um, I, I love Ruth Ware's book. She wrote this book called the woman in cabin 10 a few years ago. And I picked her as the, as the, as the, uh, the best new thriller coming out this week. Um, and I love, I want to read this book, uh, The Lunar Housewife by Caroline Woods. It's a murder mystery, spy thriller, uh, coming of age tale set in uh, the New York literary world of the 1950s. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and a beautiful little book uh, from uh, Doubleday. Um, and then my nonfiction pick, um, with, uh, I'm really dying to do. To read on this summer is the pulpit war by david kurtzer oh wow um, yeah a big important book david is a pulitzer prize winning historian of, of many books um about um, italy and, and the holocaust and he uh got uh unprecedented access to the vatican secret archives and the result of that access is probably the most important book ever written about um, the catholic church and, and second world war wow that sounds outstanding yeah, that's great. Well, those are those are great recommendations. Okay. And, 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 <laughs> and I, I hope you have fun uh, fun reading them when you are done with your your whirlwind tour. Uh, thank you, thank yeah, you, and wishing you much success. I don't know, you don't need it, but uh, the, the new novel is Portrait of an Unknown Woman. Uh, it'll be out July nineteenth, right? Uh, July 19th, yes. Uh, so when, by the time people hear this, it may be just out and in their hot little hands, but I know lots of people are waiting for it. So um, Daniel Silva, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and talk about your work and your life. And uh, thank you for all the great stories that you tell for people. Great. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure this was. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.